Hello, this is Dr. Muniz, and I will be discussing the imaging of cranial nerves 1 through 6. We will talk about neural anatomy, clinical manifestations, and imaging findings. Cranial nerves 1 and 2 are purely sensory, 3, 4, and 6 are purely motor, and the trigeminal nerve has mixed motor and sensory components. Cranial nerves in general are isointense to brain and do not enhance except for a segment of the seventh nerve. And these heavily tituated uh, sequences, um, for example, KISS, Fiesta, DRIVE, or 3UTSC, are needed to visualize the sternal segments optimally. Multiplanar high resolution MRI is mandatory for evaluation of these nerves. Let's start with. The first cranial nerve, also known as the olfactory nerve. The olfactory receptor cells reside within the superior nasal cavity and within the superior nasal septum. The axons of these olfactory receptor cells pass through the small openings in the cribriform plate, and then they synapse with the cell bodies of the mitral cells which reside in the olfactory bulb. The axons of the mitral cells, cells then continue posteriorly as the olfactory tract. The olfactory tract then continues posteriorly and divides into the lateral and medial tracts. The lateral tract uh, ends up in the region of the medial temporal lobe and the uncus, and the medial olfactory tract extends to the opposite medial olfactory tract. On imaging, we see the olfactory bulbs sitting just below the gyrus rectus. The sulcus, which sits between the gyrus rectus and the orbital gyrus, is called the olfactory sulcus. And uh, on CT, you can see the same um, um, anatomy. You can see the cribriform plate through which the small nerves, uh, um, the axons have gone through to synapse with the olfactory bulb sitting right here. Looking at some pathology, um, Kalman syndrome is association of hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism with anosmia or hyposmia. And what you're looking for is hypoplasia of the olfactory bulb. As in this case, on the normal side, you can see there's a patient who has a normal, uh, nice, um, um, anatomically normal olfactory bulbs, whereas on the abnormal um, patient side, you can see that the olfactory bulbs are very small. Also, the olfactory sulcus uh, on the left is uh, very poorly developed, and these are all findings of Kalman syndrome. There are other etiologies um, of um, anosmia. So uh, this is a patient who has an olfactory groove meningioma, a classic spot, um, and uh, these patients will often present with uh, smelling um, abnormalities. This is a patient who has an esthesia neuroblastoma growing along the nasal cavity, superior nasal cavity, into the anterior penile fossa. However, we should not forget more common entities which present with anosmia, um, as in this case where there is sinonasal polyposis and there are multiple polyps. Uh, which um, have resulted in this uh, patient's clinical uh, picture. So common things being common, don't forget sinusitis. Moving on to cranial nerve two, which is the optic nerve. And before we get to the optic nerve, uh, let's um, go over the anatomy of the globe. So you have uh, three layers. You have uh, outer layer is sclera, middle layer is uh, choroid, and the inner ear is retina. And within the retina, you have these cells called the ganglion cell layer, which is the innermost layer um, of cells. And the axons of these retinal ganglion cells um, extend posteriorly at the optic disc and form the optic nerve. Let's talk about the optic pathway. So as I mentioned earlier, the retinal ganglion cells axon um, um, is where the optic nerve originates. From there, we get to the optic chiasm. Then we get to the optic tracts. And uh, the optic tracts go into the lateral geniculate body. 
From there, we have the optic radiations, which can be, may be temporal or parietal. And then we end up at the visual cortex. So what are the different types of optic neuropathies that we may encounter on imaging? We can divide them into different uh, uh, etiologies, starting with demyelination, which is probably the most common etiology that we see. Non-arteritic ischemic arterial um, um, arteritis can also present with optic neuropathy. So this is a vascular cause for uh, optic neuropathy. There can be other inflammatory causes for optic neuropathy, infiltrative lesions uh, like malignancy, compressive lesions, toxic metabolic, hereditary, traumatic, and radiation can all result in optic neuropathy. Let's look at this case. So uh, before we get to the case, let's um, clarify one point, and that is that what is the normal signal of the optic nerve on T2-weighted images? So since the optic nerve is pretty much an extension of the brain, we're looking for the optic nerve to be the same signal as the white matter. This is a patient, a young female with vision loss, and you can notice that there is uh, enlargement of the optic chiasm and also increased T2 signal on the left greater than right, uh, which extends into the optic tracts. Post gadolinium, you can notice that there is a pretty significant enhancement of the optic nerve and optic chiasm extending back into the optic tract. And this patient had optic neuritis from multiple sclerosis. This is the initial flare on this patient, uh, which was done at the time of the orbit MRI. And the flare was pretty normal, but six months later, the flare turned abnormal, and you saw the classic um, findings of multiple sclerosis. Another patient who has uh, vision uh, issues on the right side, and of note, you can see there is um, marked enhancement at the neuroocular junction and at the optic nerve head with abnormal T2 signal. And this is a fairly classic picture for sarcoid neuritis. We should also remember some infiltrative neoplasms uh, that can uh, present with uh, vision um, problems. And this is a classic case of an optic nerve glioma. You can see that there's tubular enlargement of the left optic nerve with enhancement uh, extending posteriorly into the chiasm. As we know, these um, neoplasms are associated with neurofibromatosis type 1. And in Children, they tend to be low-grade gliomas, but in adults, they can be fairly aggressive. This is another patient who has uh, visual field defects and has vision loss, and turns out they have history of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And you notice that there's enhancement of the left uh, prechiasmatic optic nerve, as well as nodular leptomeningeal enhancement, and this is fairly classic for lymphoma. This is another classic neoplasm uh, that uh, can present with vision loss. And on post gadolinium images, you notice there's enhancement in a tram track fashion along the optic nerve sheath, and, uh, which is sort of encasing the nerve. And the nerve is sort of getting strangula strangulated here. And this is a classic finding for optic nerve sheath meningioma. And these patients can definitely present with vision loss. On CT, you can see a CT equivalent of the same uh, tram track um, abnormality. On CT, you can actually see calcification, and this would be called tram track calcification. This is another case which looks a lot like the meningium I just, uh, that I just showed you. However, uh, this lady has metastatic breast cancer and had sudden loss of uh, color vision. And this is actually leptomeningeal carcinomatosis. Lastly, this is a patient who uh, presented as rule out MS, and uh, the clinician thought that this patient had optic neuritis. And as you notice, uh, the abnormality really is not in the nerve, but it's in the optic nerve sheath. And the nerve is sort of being strangulated by this enhancing abnormality. And you can see it also on the axial post gadolinium images. So, this is another not uncommon presentation of sarcoid where they can actually get perineuritis. Um, so in addition to the optic neuritis that I showed you earlier, uh, sarcoid perineuritis is also not an uncommon entity.
a few classic compressive optic neuropathy cases. Uh, this is a patient who has a um, vision loss, uh, bitemporal hemianopsia, and uh, we have a classic snowman-shaped uh, lesion in the cella supracellar cistern. This is a patient with um, pituitary macroadenoma. Another patient who presented with bitemporal hemianopsia, and this is an obvious aneurysm in the supracellar cistern. Moving on to cranial nerves three, four, and six. We're gonna discuss these nerves together because uh, they're often examined by the clinician um, in, in, in the same fashion. So if you notice the three nerves, this is three, this is four, and this is six, they have different segments. The segment within the brainstem is called the intraaxial segment, which includes the nucleus and the part of the nerve within the um, intraaxial compartment that's called a fascicle. Then we have the cisternal segment where the nerves travel in the prepontine or pre um, interpeduncular cisterns. Then we have a component that travels within the cavernous sinus along the lateral margin. And we have a component which then enters the orbit through the superior orbital fissure. We all remember this mnemonic SO4 LR6. So cranial nerve six uh, controls lateral rectus. Cranial nerve four controls the sphere oblique, and cranial nerve three controls the remaining extraocular muscles. Let's start with cranial nerve three um, and the course of this nerve. So the nucleus resides in the midbrain, and then the um, nerve enters the interpedentular cistern, and from there it enters the cavernous sinus, and it's the uh, topmost nerve in the lateral uh, aspect of the cavernous sinus. From there, it enters the orbit through the superior orbital fissure and then divides into the superior and inferior branches. Looking at image and anatomy, you can see that the nucleus is sitting in the midbrain, uh, superior midbrain, uh, and uh, the part of the nerve which resides in the brainstem is called the fascicle. And this is the part of the nerve which has come out into the interpeduncular cistern, and that's the cisternal segment of the nerve. Uh, another look at the cisternal segment of the nerve uh, a little bit inferiorly. And this is to remind me to tell you about the relationship of the nerve with the posterior cerebral artery and the superior cerebellar artery. And so this nerve travels between these two arteries. And when you have an aneurysm, uh, it can affect uh, these nerves. Moving on to cranial nerve four, or, or the trochlear nerve, it's a very interesting nerve. Um, it is the smallest nerve in terms of the number of axons it contains. However, it has the greatest intracranial length. And that is because it is the only cranial nerve that exits from the caudal aspect of, of the brainstem and then crosses the midline. After that, it uh, enters the cavernous sinus and the superior orbital fissure, like the cranial nerve three. So here you can see the two nuclei of cranial nerve four of the trochle trochlear nerve, and uh, this is uh, at the level of the inferior colliculus. And then the two nerves then uh, cross over, decussate in the midline in the superior medullary vellum travel in the ambient cistern, and then go anteriorly, and uh, after that, they enter the cavernous sinus. So this is just to point out that uh, the cisternal segment of this nerve is difficult to see um, uh, because the nerve has an angulation. And so you can see little bits and pieces of this nerve as it travels in the ambient cistern. Moving on to cranial nerve six, or the abducens nerve, the nucleus uh, of this nerve is in the pons, and the nerve then exits at the pontomedullary junction and ascends superiorly uh, along in the prepontine cistern until it reaches the petrous apex and the durellus canal. From there, it enters into the cavernous sinus and the superior orbital fissure, um, like cranial nerves three and four. So this is just to show you the nucleus of the cranial nerve six. This is the fascicle of the um, nerve, which is the intraaxial segment. And this is the segment of the nerve in the cistern. Uh, 
and cranial nerve seven loops around the cranial nerve six nucleus, forming this bump called the facial colliculus uh, in the pons. After it passes through the systemal segment, it enters a CSF line, line cave called the Dorellus Canal. And this uh, image is to show you that uh, there's this sort of ascending um, pathway of the nerve. So it starts off low and then goes up high into the petrous apex region. So what is the Dorellus Canal? Um, it's a small uh, canal which is formed by the petrous phenoid ligament of Gruber, which extends between the petrous apex and the clivus. After these nerves have entered the cavernous sinus, we get the cavernous segment of these nerves. So you have the olfactory nerve, which is the highest one. The second highest is the cranial nerve four. You can see it's rather small. And cranial nerve six travels within the substance of the cavernous sinus, inferior to the internal carotid artery. And if you're lucky, you can sometimes pick up those nerves on high resolution imaging of the um, skull base. After these nerves have uh, traveled through the cavernous sinus, they enter the orbit through the superior orbital fissure. And uh, this is uh, the so-called annulus of Zinn, this green colored structure, which is a common, ten common tendinous ring for the origin of the four recti muscles. And uh, cranial nerve, um, uh, the trochlear nerve uh, actually travels in the um, outer margin uh, outside of this ring, whereas the ocular motor and abducens nerves travel within the uh, common tendinous ring. So let's talk about lesions uh, affecting these cranial nerves. So again, the lesions can be within the brainstem, within the systemal segment. For the cranial nerve six, uh, lesions can be at the petrous apex. They can be in the cavernous sinus or in the orbit. So let's start with some intraaxial lesions. Um, so, you know, I love categories, so we can go down the category list. Lesions can be vascular, inflammatory, and neoplastic. So let's look at some examples. Uh, this is a patient with acute onset diplopia and vertical skew, and they have a tiny acute infarction uh, at the nucleus of the third nerve, which may be difficult to pick up on the flare and T2 weighted images, but is uh, fairly obvious on the DWI sequence. So this is a patient with mid vein infarct. This is a patient who had uh, acute right six nerve palsy, and you can see that there is a enhancing lesion right at the fascicle of the right six nerve as it's coming out of the pontomedullary medullary junction, acute demyelinating lesion. This is a patient who has a, a ptosis and um, palsy of cranial nerve uh, three, and uh, there's a lesion bright um, at the fascicle as it's coming out into the interpredentular fossa, uh, which is bright on both flare and T2-weighted images and does not enhance. Uh, and this was a low-grade glioma. Moving on to lesions um, uh, in the cistern, and again, they uh, follow the same uh, categorization. Um, and uh, one of the classic lesions uh, that can present with uh, cranial nerve three palsy is an aneurysm of the posterior communicating artery. So this patient has right-sided diplopia and there is a small uh, posterior communicating, uh, communicating artery aneurysm on the right. So let's talk a little bit about uh, pupil sparing versus pupil um, involving third nerve palsy. So for that, we have to know that the superficial parasympathetics travel along the surface of the cranial nerve three. So if you have something that's extrinsically compressing the nerve, for example, an aneurysm or uncle herniation, these patients will have a blown pupil or a dilated pupil because the parasympathetics are being affected. And as we know, the parasympathetics are responsible for uh, constriction of the pupil. However, if you have a, a patient who has an infarction um, of the um, central vasculature of the nerve, for example, in diabetics, they are going to have a uh, more conventional um, you know, involvement of the orbit in which uh, the pupil will be normal in size. This is another patient who has a blown pupil, a uh, status post-trauma, and you can see there's a large sub uh, subdural hematoma with uncle herniation. And 
the cranial nerve three is sort of traveling in the ambient system right there, and this results in um, uh, a blown pupil. And you have compression of the cranial nerve. And this is just a drawing showing you uh, the same thing on a coronal image. You can see the, the third nerve being compressed by the uncus. Sometimes cranial neuropathy can be a false localizing sign. And this is especially true for uh, patients who have sixth nerve palsy. And uh, that's because if you have any entity which results in changes in the intracranial pressure, either increased or decreased, you can get downward displacement of the brain stem, and which causes stretching of the sixth nerve right at the uh, Durello's canal. And it's interesting to know that approximately 30% of patients with pseudotumor cerebri have sixth nerve paresis as the only neurologic deficit. So it's a false localizing sign um, in this case. So let's look, look at some disease entities. So this patient has a left-sided third nerve palsy and there is enhancement of the cisternal segment of the third nerve on the left. And this patient had neurosyphilis. There was also an abscess uh, sitting right in the frontal lobe. This is a more common cause of um, um, involvement of the cisternal segment. Uh, this is a patient with Lyme disease, and there is an uh, enhancement of the cisternal segment of the sixth nerve, this patient who presented with sixth nerve palsy. And this is the area of the Dorello's canal right there. Neoplasms, um, this is a patient who has a right cranial nerve 4 palsy, and there's a mass sitting along the course of the fourth nerve in the ambient cistern, which has this sort of lobular longitudinal appearance. And um, another interesting finding is that the right superior oblique muscle is slightly small, smaller compared to the left. This is another patient who has a right sixth nerve palsy, and this turns out to be a schwannoma of the right sixth nerve. So you have to recognize the classic course of this nerve extending from the pontomedullary junction going up and into the petrous apex. Moving on to the next anatomic area, uh, the petrous apex is um, where the cranial nerve six enters into the um, cavernous sinus. And so if you have a petrous apical lesion, uh, these patients will end up with six nerve palsies. So this is a patient who has a, a six nerve palsy. And um, on these T2 weighted images, it's kind of difficult to see uh, what's going on, but definitely see that there is something, of a, a, a small flow void, which is uh, extending right up to the Dorello's canal. And on the post-guide images, you can see that there's focal outpouching, and this was an, an aneurysm uh, arising from the basilar artery, presenting with sixth nerve palsy. This is a young child who has um, uh, ear pain, otitis media, and sixth and seventh nerve palsies. And on bone, um, on the CT, you can see that there's some erosion of the bone. And on MRI, there is enhancement of the petrous apex, IAC and the middle cranial fossa. This is a patient with petrous apicitis, and this entity is also known as Gradinego syndrome. Moving on to other entities, this is a patient who has a left sixth nerve palsy. Uh, you notice there's this um, enhancing mass right at the uh, Dorello's canal with a dural tail, and this was a meningioma uh, resulting in the sixth nerve palsy. So kind of a petroclavial meningioma. This is a patient who had diplopia and, again, another um, case of sixth nerve palsy. And um, if you know where to look, you see the right sixth nerve uh, is fairly normal. Uh, the left sixth nerve is very abnormal. And also there's this, you know, lesion sitting right um, at the uh, point where the sixth nerve goes into the Dorello's canal. And you look at the rest of the brain and, and they're studded with metastases. So this is a metastatic lesion. Uh, causing six nerve palsy. Moving on to the next location where you can get lesions of the cranial nerve three, four, and six, and that's the cavernous sinus. Remember that these three nerves uh, sort of travel together in the cavernous sinus, and um, things uh, that can result in um, cranial nerve palsies in the cavernous sinus include vascular lesions, like a, a large carotid aneurysm which is obviously displacing or compressing these nerves. 
This is a patient who had a sinus infection of five days ago and then presented with sudden renal neuropathies. Um, and um, on the contrast enhanced study, you can see that the um, major finding is that there's lack of enhancement of the cavernous sinus, which you also see on MRI that the cavernous sinuses are filled with soft tissue. And on MRI, post gadolinium images, again, lack of enhancement. And so this is a classic finding of cavernous sinus septic thrombophlebitis. This is a patient who has um, a left six nerve palsy, which is acute. And on the initial finding, it was somewhat difficult to um, pick it up, but you can see there is a subtle soft tissue uh, which is encasing the um, carotid artery in the cavernous sinus. Um, and one month later, patient returned and it had obviously gotten much bigger. And this is a case of uh, pseudotumor artillosa Hunt syndrome. Uh, and post uh, steroids, it actually got much better. So Tulosa Hunt syndrome is an idiopathic nonspecific inflammatory condition involving the cavernous sinus and orbital apex. These patients can present with severe headaches, painful ophthalmoplegia, and cranial neuropathy. And on imaging, um, the cl classic findings are inflammatory tissue at the orbital apex or cavernous sinus. So there's going to be slightly dark on T2-weighted um, images um, and um, enhancement of this abnormality. This is pretty much a diagnosis of exclusion. You have to first make sure the patient doesn't have any of these other diseases, like sarcoid, lymphoma, fungal infection, meningioma, other granulomatous disease, or metastatic disease. This is another patient who has um, uh, a right six nerve palsy, and there is a lesion in the right cavernous sinus, which is bright on t 2 weighted images. On the axial image, you can see that it's somewhat lobular and um, you know, extends anteroposteriorly and has a tubular configuration. And this is a classic schwannoma of the cranial nerve 3, which is extending from the cavernous sinus into the orbit through the superior orbital fissure. This is a patient who has um, left-sided cranial nerves 3 and 4th palsy. And there is this lesion sitting within the left cavernous sinus, which is crossing over medial to the carotid artery and encasing it has a homogeneous enhancement and dural tails. And this is a classic meningioma of the cavernous sinus. So to differentiate this from schwannoma, uh, meningiomas tend to uh, cross over uh, medial to the artery and enc encase the artery, whereas schwannomas tend to be more lateral in the cavernous sinus. Never forget metastatic disease. This was initially called a meningioma, but this turned out to be a melanoma metastasis. Uh, common things being common, um, you know, patients with pituitary adenoma um, often will have uh, the neoplasm extending into the cavernous sinus, and these patients will, uh, can present with neuropathies of 3, 4, or 6. Moving on to cranial nerve 5, and cranial nerve 5 has uh, three segments, B1, B2, and B3, and that's the reason it's called trigeminal nerve. So let's start with the different segments of this nerve. So the primary sensory nucleus resides within the pons, and uh, the motor root, uh, which comes off from the primary, um, uh, uh, excuse me, the sensory root, which comes off from the primary sensory nucleus, is actually fairly large and extends anteriorly, uh, comes out of the pons. Then you have the motor nucleus, which is anterior and medial to the primary sensory nucleus and from which emanates the sensory root, which is actually much smaller than the motor root. There are two other nuclei, which we should be aware of. There's the nucleus of the trigeminal nerve, which goes up into the midbrain called the mesencephalic nucleus, and the other nucleus, which extends down into the spine and is called the spinal nucleus. So the sensory root, the large sensory root, enters the Meckel's cave through an opening called the porous trigeminus, and there it uh, forms the uh, Gasserian ganglion. The small uh, motor root extends below the large sensory root and then enters the Meckel's cave and joins V3 after it's gone, uh, come off and um, has entered the foramen valley. So um, 
within the Meckel's cave, the um, Gesserian ganglion gives off the three divisions uh, of the trigeminal nerve, uh, ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular. And ophthalmic and maxillary are sensory, whereas the mandibular division is both sensory and motor. And that's because of the con contribution of this small motor root, which joins V3 after it uh, exits the foramina valley. The root, root entry zone, or REZ, is the point of change from central to peripheral myelin. And usually the root entry zone is about three to seven millimeters after the exit of the nerve from the anterior pons. So let's look at each of the three nerves, uh, three divisions. Um, so the superior most division of the trigeminal nerve is called ophthalmic nerve or, or V1. And uh, the V1, um, you know, comes off from the Gesserian ganglion and then enters the cavernous sinus and then enters the orbit through the superior orbital fissure where it divides into three branches. Uh, and then these are the lacrimal, frontal, and nasociliary branches. The second division of trigeminal nerve is, is V2. And after it um, arises from the Gesserian ganglion, again, it also enters the cavernous sinus and uh, is, is the most inferior most nerve uh, along the lateral margin of the cavernous sinus. From there, it enters foramen rotundum. It's a foramen in the, in the bone. After that, it enters the pterygopalatine fossa, where it joins up with the pterygopalatine ganglion. After that, it enters the inferior orbit through the infraorbital fissure and foramen, and then comes out um, in the front of the um, uh, maxillary sinus through the infraorbital uh, foramen. On imaging, uh, on axial images, you can see the inferior orbital fissure, and, and um, on the right, you can see the foramen rotundum extending out into the pterygopalatine fossa. On these coronal images, you can nicely see the foramen rotundum and median canal. And on the sagittal image, you can um, observe the course of the infraorbital nerve, after which it comes off and uh, supplies this uh, area of skin just below the orbit. Our third division of the cranial nerve uh, five is the mandibular nerve, uh, which uh, again comes off from the Gasserian ganglion. And unlike V1 and V2, which enter the cavernous sinus, V3 directly goes down into the masticator space through the foramen of valley, which you can see nicely on the CT uh, axial image. After it exits the skull base, um, and enters the uh, masticator space, it divides into multiple branches. Um, there are multiple um, motor branches, for example, uh, branches to the masseter muscle, the pterygoid muscles, um, and mylohyde muscle. There are also multiple uh, sensory branches, including the lingual nerve, bu the buccal nerve, the inferior alveolar nerve, and the, the majority of the nerve continues inferiorly as the inferior alveolar nerve, where it enters the mandible. On this coronal image, you can nicely see the course of the nerve, and V3 is entering the masticator space and then entering the mandible as the inferior alveolar nerve. So lesions of cranial nerve five, again, can be uh, categorized into different segments. So you can have lesions in the brain stem, where the nuclei are. You can have lesions in the cisternal segment. You can have lesions in the Meckel's cave, cavernous sinus, superior orbital fissure, inferior orbital fissure, or the foramen valley, or in the distal branches of these nerves. And all of these can present with uh, neuropathy of this nerve. So what are the common lesions that we can in encounter? This is a classic lesion which encompasses the origin of the nerve um, uh, at the ponto, um, uh, in, in the pons, and it extends out into the cisternal segment and into the Meckel's cave. And uh, this is a classic schwannoma of trigeminal nerve, um, including the, uh, the uh, intraaxial segment as well as the um, uh, segment in the cistern. Uh, 
and the Meckel cave. Moving on to this topic of trigeminal neuralgia, what is this? So this is a sudden and unilateral severe brief stabbing recurrent pain in the distribution of one or more divisions of the trigeminal nerve. This entity is classified into two types. So the, the more common one is the idiopathic or classical um, trigeminal neuralgia, also known as type 1, in which the duration of pain is, is uh, short and the patient is asymptomatic but then perox between paroxysms. It's very intense, sharp stabbing or uh, superficial pain. And uh, there are definite trigger zones uh, which can um, um, cause these, uh, this um, pain to come on, like eating, washing face, or brushing teeth. And the neurological exam is negative. And this is a more common type of trigeminal neuralgia. It tends to be in patients who are more than 50 years of age and women, and is usually related to neurovascular contact. As opposed to this, there is a uh, atypical trigeminal neuralgia or type 2 trigeminal neuralgia, which is different because uh, the pain um, characteristics of the pain are very different. Uh, the duration of pain tends to be more continuous. And uh, the trigger zones are smaller than the classical uh, trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, patients, uh, the paroxysms of pain are not stereotypical. And so, i.e., they're not uh, similar in, in, in the individual patient. And this is less common, but um, in, this is where, uh, you, know, you know, this is what you have to watch out for and uh, make sure that you're not calling something just a type 1 tri trigeminal neuralgia when they could have an underlying lesion, uh, including tumors, demyelination or other uh, disease entities. Uh, type 2 trigeminal neuralgia tends to be, uh, have a younger onset. So let's look at this patient who presents with right-sided trigeminal neuralgia. And there is a, definitely a, a vessel which is touching the trigeminal nerve. And you can see both on the, uh, also on the KISS images. And this was the superior cerebral artery, which is the, um, uh, the most common cause um, for neurovascular contact in about 75 to 80% cases. So when do we know that uh, what we are seeing as a neurovascular contact is actually responsible for the patient's symptoms? Because we often see uh, neurovascular contact on asymptomatic individuals. So um, it's been um, noticed that when the artery is actually either compressing or distorting the nerve or causing atrophy of the nerve, that's when uh, it tends to be a much more significant association of the neurovascular contact with the symptoms. If, you're, if the nerve and the artery are merely touching or in proximity, then uh, that could just be a normal variant. So this is such a case. This patient has right-sided trigeminal neuralgia. Um, you can see that there is, um, the left uh, trigeminal nerve looks normal, but the right trigeminal nerve is markedly atrophic. And there is the superior cerebellar artery, which is um, contacting this nerve. And this is a true um, neurovascular contact with atrophy of the nerve. Treatment for uh, trigeminal neuralgia can be macrovascular decompression. Uh, the surgeon can go in and uh, put a um, sort of a pledget right at the root entry zone uh, to prevent the artery uh, contacting the nerve. Uh, sometimes a gamma knife can also be performed at the root entry zone to treat this entity. And this is an example of a pledget placed uh, for microvascular decompression on the left. Uh, remember that this um, uh, pledget can uh, cause enhancement um, either of the pledget itself or of the nerve, and uh, it should not be mistaken as a tumor. So not everything that is uh, labeled as trigeminal neuralgia is that. Um, what are the other mimics that can present as a quote-unquote trigeminal neuralgia? This is a patient who presented with uh, trigeminal neuralgia, and um, this was simply a case of multiple sclerosis. So in, in MS, uh, Trigeminal neuralgia occurs frequently and may precede the diagnosis of MS in 15% of individuals. So always be um, aware of that fact. And um, so this is a, a fairly classic appearance uh, on, on the brain MRI. You can see these periventricular lesions. This is a patient who has right-sided trigeminal neuralgia, and uh, there is definitely enhancement of the cisternal segment of the nerve. And this turns out to be Lyme disease.
This was an interesting uh, case, a um, patient with upper jaw pain and numbness left cheek in periorbita. And initially, uh, this was um, called as a meningioma of the um, left cavernous sinus. However, um, we looked a little bit further and noticed that there was this uh, abnormality sitting in the left terebopalatine fossa in the vidian canal, also in the foramen rotundum on higher sequences. And um, as we kept looking, we noticed that there's uh, this soft tissue abnormality extending from the terebopalatine fossa all the way down into the heart palate. And there was erosion of the heart palate. So this was a patient with a perineural spread of adenoid cystic carcinoma of the palate, which uh, presented uh, with trigeminal symptoms because of retrograde uh, spread into the intracranial compartment. So always be aware of this um, entity in patients who have confounding symptoms. This is a patient who presented with left-sided jaw pain and trigeminal neuralgia. And um, on MRI, T1 weighted image, you can see that the fat in the marrow has been completely replaced and is bright on T2 weighted images. There's also a soft tissue nodule sitting right at the location where the inferior alveolar nerve comes out as the mental nerve. Also notice that there's a big, huge node in right level two and smaller nodes in the right level one. And this was a case of lymphoma, uh, which uh, was um, initially labeled as trigeminal neur neuralgia. So uh, in conclusion, what are the takeaway points uh, that we've discussed so far? Um, the nerves uh, look like brain um, and they do not enhance. So anytime you see enhancement of cranial nerves one through six, that is abnormal. Um, if you have lesions in the cavernous sinus and superior orbital fissure, you can have multiple cran cranial nerves involved at the same time. So it could be three, four, six, or even V1. Um, if you have an aneurysm, uh, which involves the cranial nerve uh, uh, three, you get a blown pupil or a pupil involving cranial nerve three palsy. For cranial nerve six, the petrous apex is a very important uh, location, and you should be looking for uh, lesions in that specific area. And perineural spread along cranial nerve five can present as a mass in the cavernous sinus and homeless syndrome. Clinical knowledge of nerve examination is an asset when interpreting these images. Thank you very much.